breakfast. Uh, the fuel crisis then and Labour Party conference do dominate this morning's headlines. Let's get stuck in with Sam Lewis, political commentator and contributor to Young Voices UK. Good morning, Sam. Good morning, Callum. Thanks for having me on. It's our pleasure. Thanks for joining us. Um, shall we start then with the front page of the Times? So Boris Johnson going to get plans today to bring in uh, the army, to bring in soldiers to drive uh, lorries, to drive fuel tankers, because between 50 and 90 percent of petrol stations in Britain have now run dry. Um, so this is, I mean, there's a lot to go at here, isn't there? This is a shortage of HGV drivers. This is the government's message on don't panic buy, having precisely no effect by the sound of it. Um, it is chaos out there. And, and now the army might be coming in as well. Well, this is the thing. I think this highlights just how much of an artificial crisis it is to begin with, because the army won't get to work for a few days. Any changes to visas will still take a few weeks to to get the uh, HGV drivers in. So this just shows that the ultimate point is that this is a shortage of lorry drivers that has caused the problems. And this has been across a range of industries from supermarkets to fast food chains, and that this crisis stemmed from somebody leaking Uh, from a private meeting 10 days ago that there was going to be some pressure on BP. And this just caused a massive panic. And I think it's ridiculous that it's got to this stage. Mm. I suppose, I mean, on that point particularly, though, the, the, the fact that there was going to be, there was concern, there was going to be shortages and difficulties is something that is in the public interest. So I think in around, you know, in, in the big picture, we, we, we can't be critical of that leak, can we? Actually, that's information that we as the public deserve to have. At the same time, I think that the, well, I mean, Grant Shapps blamed the Road Haulers Association for mm. leaking the details. Um, and ultimately, there should be some sort of, of secrets that when it comes to this, because this is a vital industry. This isn't toilet paper. You know, this is far more serious than what happened last year. This is something where, you know, I saw images where ambulances were struggling to get fuel when they're on their emergency rounds. And this is something which is in the public's interest to know, but as a result of it being leaked, it's led to a far worse crisis than what what should have what it should have been, and this is something that needs to be taken into account in future. I think uh, that was uh, what Grant Chaps was speaking to Sky, wasn't he, when he was suggesting that it's worth seeing that uh, yeah. Rod McKenzie is managing director of policy and public affairs at the Road Haulage Association. Um, he denies the leak. In fact, a senior figure uh, saying that it's nonsense uh, that, that accusation. Uh, but I take your point on, on all of that. What about then the government response? So I've been reading an interesting piece by Ian Duncan Smith in the Telegraph this morning, um, which says, "Don't blame Brexit for driver shortages. Our brainless bureaucracy is the real culprit." The government is finding out just how difficult it can be to retain control while being buffeted by the unexpected. Uh, That is is the criticism here, isn't it? We weren't ready for this. Well, I think that we've got to get over the fact of blaming Brexit for everything. I think we potentially weren't as prepared as we should have been, but there are a shortage of lorry drivers across Europe. You know, Germany is reporting this as well. And I think this is something where 40, 50 years ago, when people's living standards... Um, were at a certain level, getting a HGV license was actually a good way to go up in the world. But at the moment, there's not enough, um, the reputation of the industry isn't that which would get people into the industry to begin with. And there needs to be more incentives to to get young people into it and and driving lorries, because at the the moment, you know, we realise that they are so vital to the the nation. Um, And yet there hasn't been enough investment in infrastructure to make it worthwhile. You know, lorry drivers are are driving 12 hours a day, they're living in um, you know, tin cans at night, they're being woken at 3am by other lorry drivers going. There needs to be, and they don't necessarily have hot showers for a few days on end, there needs to be an investment in you know, where lorry drivers stop for the evening uh, at petrol stations and at um, uh, other areas. And also you have to take into account that the, uh, the for example, at Kent, um, when we left the European Union, Obviously, all the backlog and the queues that happened there. Yeah. This is something that over Lorry drivers people... spending Christmas on a runway. Do we remember that last year? That, well, was, exactly. that was unpleasant for lorry drivers, to say the least, wasn't it? Not yeah. Well, exactly. I think the incentives there show that people from Europe don't want to come here and drive lorries. Mm. So I don't know how many people will take up uh, the 5,000 visas that are being offered by the government. But the simple fact of the matter is that in the long term, this is such a vital industry to well, the supply um, of goods within the UK that we need to train our own workers up for this.
What does it say, uh, just uh, on this, you know, what does it say about the competence of the government? Because its reputation um, surely gets d- damaged by moments like this, where actually there is a crisis. Um, you know, whether that's been because of panic buying or because there's underlying issues that need addressed, whatever, there is a crisis now. Uh, potentially 90% of petrol stations are running out of petrol. Um, and that points to government incompetence, doesn't it? To an extent, but I don't think we can blame the government for everything here. If, if this has been leaked from a meeting, this is something that just, through herd behaviour, caused panic buying. And I think the government weren't on message to begin with, um, even though this whole time they have, the, you know, they have got all their ministers to say there is no fuel shortage, because ultimately there isn't a fuel crisis. It's this completely artificially made. I mean, there is a fuel crisis now. Surely we can, can we not all agree on that? So if there wasn't one to begin with, it feels like there's one now. We've seen the queues over the weekend. People, you've mentioned that emergency vehicles can't get access to fuel. People can't get access to fuel. I mean, whether there was one to begin with or not, surely we're in the midst of one now. Well, uh, run on the banks happen because people lose confidence in each other. But this is, I think, just what happened last year with the toilet paper all over again. People panic when they it see it and, it and it happens. So... Potentially, there's something to be done about messaging in future, but I think, you know, Shell, ExxonMobil and Green Energy talked about how the, they've reiterated time and time again that this is simply a temporary spike in customer demand. So hopefully within the next few days, as people, you know, over the weekend, people fill up, people go shopping, people have time to go and get petrol. During the week, however, hopefully um, they should be able to restock fuel and there shouldn't be a national fuel shortage by the end of the week. Well, let's see what happens. There's potentially a cabinet meeting today to discuss deploying the army to deliver fuel. Uh, It also follows the suspension of competition law to allow oil firms to uh, target fuel deliveries at particular petrol stations because of panic buying over the last few days. Uh, So all the least on that throughout the day today for you uh, on Times Radio. Um, Shall we turn to the Labour Party conference next then, Sam? Because uh, we're going to hear from the Shadow Chancellor today. Um, I mean, it's fair to say the week is starting slightly overshadowed by by comments from Angela Rayner yesterday, Deputy Mm -hmm. um, uh, Leader of the Labour Party. Um, And I suppose it, it sort of... I mean, first of all, the language used, I suppose we can start there, can't we? Uh, is this appropriate? Or how do you feel about the language that Angela Rayner used over the weekend describing Conservatives as, as scum? Well, I think it's frankly ridiculous. She seems to use the excuse that her accent is different to a London accent, that she can use whatever language she wants, and she, she's trying to say that it's okay to use this language. But if she wants to represent her all her constituents, if she not just those that go to the pub, if she wants to represent... Um, the United Kingdom on the international on the international scene. She can't use this language. I just find it ridiculous that she thought she could get away with it, and that she hasn't retracted what she said. Well, indeed. So she she hasn't necessarily apologised. She's you know we played a clip of her a short while ago, kind of explaining really why why she's used the language that she has. But I think what's pro- possibly notable about all of this as well is that Sir Keir Starmer hasn't backed her. Um, he's refused to back his deputy. Reports the Times this morning. Um, he's co- he contradicted a shadow chancellor over tax rises. As I say, shadow chancellor uh, Reeves, Rachel Reeves, will be speaking later on today at party conference. I just wonder, Sir Keir Starmer, he's not got off to a great start. That's <laughs> it, really. I think it's objectively fair to say this Labour Party conference for him. Well, I think that the previous leader, Jeremy Corbyn, left quite a lot of rot within the the works within the Labour Party, and he's just having to to spend a few years getting through it. But I I agree. I think the problem with Keir Starmer is that you you never know where he stands on things. Um, Did you not read his 12.5,000 million word essay the other day? Did that not clarify things for you? I, well, I I had better things to do, I will admit. So, um, I, I did not get quite through it. I, I kind of had hoped he'd make instead what Ed Miliband did and put it on a stone because at least that was a bit quicker to read. But um, no, I did not get round to reading it, but it seems no one else has. And it seems a lot of it was leaked beforehand um, and there was nothing of substance within it. And, and so I, I just don't see the point in um, reading it. But I think that Keir Starmer needs to get more of a grip on the party and lead it in the right direction. And I think the the vote that passed yesterday, which changed some of the laws um, on and ultimately uh, changed some of the laws that gave members powers to get rid of their MPs and encourage thousands to join the party and choose Mr. Corbyn to begin with, uh, is a good start. And that ultimately, this will mean that they can spend more MPs can spend more time talking to local constituents rather than having to schmooze local party members the whole time. And also this will cut down on interest to the party. You don't necessarily care about the party in the long term. So 
these are positive moves, but it will still take time to, to get rid of the rot that was left by the previous leader. I suppose in terms of uh, what he stands for, Sakir Starmer, and what the Labour Party stand for, um, we're going to get a bit more of an idea of that today when uh, Rachel Reeves, the Labour Shadow Chancellor, delivers her speech. Um, so, I mean, there's there's things on tax, really, I suppose, is what's kind of been briefed ahead of time. Uh, so Sakir Starmer yesterday on Sunday declined to rule out proposing income tax rises in the future. Uh, Labour also announcing it would review a thousand different tax reliefs uh, and ditch some of them. Tax breaks for private schools and private equity managers would be ended if Sir entered number 10. Uh, the entire system of business rates would also be scrapped, uh, replaced by measures more focused on helping small companies. So these are the sorts of things, Sam, that I th- we're going to get some more detail on from the Shadow Chancellor today. So it's, it's I mean, p- perhaps your attempts to simplify the tax system and, and, you know, from a Labour point of view, would be to make it fairer. It, it's probably where they're get, what they're guessing at with all of this. Mm. I mean, that is obviously what they're trying to to get across, that they want to simplify it and, and, and make it and reduce inequality and create jobs. But at the same time, given the initial outcry over a 1.25 percentage point increase uh, in the national insurance and the fact that Labour opposed it, I don't, I don't see how they think that any tax rise is going to gain them votes and, and be a vote winner. Um, I mean, he want, as you say, he wants to create a wealth tax um and he wants to attack non domicile tax status, and those may win across a few votes, but I don't think you can overhaul the entire business rate system as he wants to do and, and, and simply tax uh, in order to gain more votes. It, it simply won't work. Sam, thank you for your thoughts this morning. Nice to speak to you. Thanks very uh, much, Sam. Cheers, and I will catch you soon. That's Sam Lewis, political commentator and contributor to Young Voices UK.